Live from Case at 12, the night beat starts right now. A live look at radar tonight. Storm still far out northwest of San Antonio. So how long will it be until we could see some rain here? We'll check in with meteorologist Adam Caskey coming up. And a deadly gun battle leaving residents rattled at a local apartment complex. One San Antonio mother sharing her concerns and where police are at in their investigation. Coming up. And a change when it comes to immigration enforcement. The new guidance from Homeland Security. But first. It just hours before rain is set to roll in power problems, leaving residents frustrated on the far southwest side. Neighbors in the Cinco Lakes subdivision say they're being left in reoccurring periods of darkness tonight. Just after 530 this afternoon, CPS Energy announced that all outages due to Tuesday's storms were fixed. But hours later, people in the Cinco Lakes subdivision were still experiencing those stuttering outages. Lights even coming back on mid interview. R O H A. Perfect. And you can look at me, it's like the camera's not here. Okay. <laughs> um, That's Jennifer Troja. She says that she was without power for three hours today. She's one of several people who shared their experiences with power problems in the neighborhood that sits just outside of Loop 1604 and south of Highway 90. Troja saying the outages have been an ongoing problem. I've been dealing with power surges and outages for months. I mean, at a minimum weekly, sometimes more, and the surges are just a whole separate story. Sometimes the lights will flicker off and on for two or three hours at a time, and you don't technically lose power, but it's gone. Like, and then it comes back. And in the meantime, all my appliances are getting fried. All right, so what's going on here? We reached out to CPS Energy about the concerns from residents. We are still waiting for a response at this hour. We'll let you know what develops. This all happening as San Antonio braces for another round of rain. Yeah, meteorologist Adam Kasky tracking it all for us tonight, including a thunderstorm warning, Adam. Yeah, severe thunderstorm warning out in the hill country affecting parts of western Edwards County. You can see this yellow box that pops up here on the final frame. Line of thunderstorms coming together as it moves eastward. It's slowly moving eastward, but we do have this one severe thunderstorm warning for basically Rock Springs and westward toward the county line. That's until 1045 p.m. There could be some little pockets of hail up to about the size of quarters or one inch in diameter and the potential for a few rogue wind gusts up to 60 miles per hour. We're not anticipating strong or severe thunderstorms around San Antonio. A lot of this activity, although the rain is going to fill in, the storms should weaken as they head eastward. Our atmosphere just isn't as primed, especially as we get later on into the night for severe weather. Locally right now, we don't have anything popping up around us. Our rain chances, however, will be increasing as we head toward the morning commute. Here's the big picture and you can see a lot of activity in New Mexico and to Texas. And this is all just coming together right now. It's going to continue to do so through the night. I'll time it out for you. I'll let you know what it means for the morning commute, how much rain we could see and Friday night football. The odds of seeing some storms. See you in a bit. All right, thanks, Adam. Now to another kind of power problem. The pandemic put a pause on utility disconnections. Those behind on their electric bills could see the lights go out, though, beginning tomorrow. That's when CPS Energy will resume those disconnections. Saws, meanwhile, says it will begin water disconnections on October 19th. About three quarters of Saws residential customers are overdue on a payment plan, and final notices have just begun going out to others. Saws and CPS Energy are encouraging customers to get on a payment plan to avoid disconnection. CPS Energy says nearly 72,000 residential customers are behind on payments, but tomorrow's disconnections will first center around those considered severely overdue. We are talking about customers that have not made no payments in the last year, and we have called them and they have not returned any phone calls to us. If you are behind on your utility bills, we have some helpful information you can access right now on our website. Just look for this story on KSAT.com. Residents caught off guard as the sound of gunfire rattled through their apartment complex. That shootout more than just scary. It was also deadly. Two people injured, a third victim dying there on a scene. This is a story we've been following since the six o'clock newscast. And the night team's John Paul Baraja spoke with neighbors at that northeast side apartment complex. It's on Bentley near Mid Crown and Walsham Road. One mother left with concern for her family. 
My son called me at work three times. I had to answer the phone. He said they shooting. I said go upstairs. I don't know. I want to move. Like this is dangerous. A gunfight turning more than dangerous on the 8,000 block of Bentley. Police say one man died on scene. Two others rushed to the hospital in critical condition. The woman we spoke with didn't want to be identified, but said her 17 year old disabled son was at home when he heard multiple loud bangs. Bullets don't have names on them, and people don't understand that. She's grateful her kids weren't hurt. Our camera zoomed into the crime scene, and it looks as if at least 10 shell casings were marked by investigators. It's not fair that our kids have to be subject to grown people and their stupidity. It's, 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 it's dumb. As investigators tried piecing this case together, they focused in on this maroon car. Multiple officers photographed, searched, and inspected it. All they could tell us is they are questioning a group of men, and at this time, everyone's a suspect and everyone's a victim until they get more information. I'm, I'm kind of scared to even sleep out here tonight because you don't know what's going to be the aftermath. You don't know who's going to come back, who's going to do what, if it's retaliation. You don't know. You, you won't know until it happens. All right, obviously we're having some sort of audio problems there with John Paul. But thanks for that report, John Paul. A high-speed chase, shots fired, one man dead more than 12 hours later. An identity for the 39-year-old killed by a Bear County deputy still not publicly released tonight. It started this morning when deputies were called to a convenience store for a man scaring customers. That led to a chase that was later terminated. Sheriff Javier Salazar says the man was later seen driving in circles on Petranco Road at one point the deputy hanging on to the suspect's car. Investigators say there was also a struggle. The deputy shot that suspect. It happened near Petranco and Sundance Crest. The sheriff said it was believed that suspect had contact with mental health units several times in recent weeks. San Antonio 311 handles hundreds of thousands of residential complaints every single year. And according to its own statistics, it's good at having those service requests addressed and then closed in a timely manner. But as the night team's Dylan Collier reports, some people who reach out for help say the city didn't resolve anything before moving on in their case. It's tonight's Defenders report. This quaint house with the beautiful garden on Quintana Road was Virginia Garcia's residence for decades before she passed away this summer at the age of 97. As Garcia's health deteriorated, so did the condition of the home next door. This house was beautiful. They kept it immaculate. Garcia's daughter, Mary, said it began to fall into a state of disrepair in 2018 after the man living there struggled to make ends meet and then left altogether, leaving behind a property that has become so overrun with pests, Mary had to pay for rodent control and adjust her dying mother's living situation. We moved her from the bedroom she was in because of the rats crawling on the fence. City 311 records show at least a half dozen complaints were filed regarding the address between August 2020 and last spring. And while Mary said she at first had fruitful conversations with a code compliance officer, she's recently been left in the dark about why the home is still standing. Do you not have a deadline? Is there no deadline? For this. You know, and there's one right there, and, <laughs> and they're everywhere. So, Andrew, a resident of the Redland Estates on the far north side, reached out to 311 this summer after heavy rains created a mosquito nightmare for him and his neighbors. So, uh, eventually, somebody said, Hey, maybe it's one of these businesses across the way. Residents found pools of standing water and spas being stored outside this nearby building. While city officials claim they worked with the owner to correct the issue, Spa management told us the mosquito breeding ground is actually this spillage pond a quarter mile away. Andrew says amidst the finger pointing, his complaint was closed, even as his mosquito troubles persisted. I felt lied to. Yeah, because uh, I was told the, the problem was changed or fixed. We like to think that um, 311 should be your first point of contact. 311 director Paula Stallcup says her staff logs more than a million interactions with the public a year. Thank you for calling City of San Antonio 311. How may I help you? Most of which are still handled over the phone and farms out close to a half million service requests to the appropriate city departments on an annual basis. Internal data shows 311 has a closure rate of well over 80% for each city council district, 
Impressive parity compared to many other U.S. cities, where allegations abound that similar programs ignore some, often low-income parts of town. So we don't treat any call any differently. The Stall Cup concedes, however, that there is room to improve the dialogue in some cases. The complaint they had is that the city would close their complaint but not resolve their complaint. I think that the word is sometimes closed does not mean resolved. There are different reasons for closure and I think that that is something that we are definitely working on with the community to understand the nuances between the two. Then there are those requests that fall by the wayside. After these industrial barrels near a west side via bus stop were reported to 311 as a possible safety hazard in early June, it was assigned to code enforcement, which blamed glitches in its new software for why no one had addressed it until we reached out. In late June, a department spokeswoman said the tipped over barrel was full of trash bags and cement and that they were working with the property owner to remove all of the containers. But by late September, nearly four months after the original complaint came into 311, the cleanup had not been completed, putting this request firmly in the late category. The type of lapse in communication the city contends it is working to address. We want to be able to tell them what did we do, right? And that's really important here, and that's something that we're working on. For the Defenders, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. The city's building standards board in March of 2020 ordered that home on Quintana Road to be demolished within 30 days. Then the COVID-19 pandemic hit, halting all demolitions except in emergency situations. Mary says she was not updated by the city until August after the defenders began asking about that specific property. We're going to continue to keep an eye on the radar tonight. Meteorologist Adam Kasky with Wind San Antonio could expect to see some of this rain roll in and what it's going to mean for your morning commute. Plus the Biden administration with new guidance on immigration enforcement. What's changing next on the night beat. Some new guidance along the border. The Department of Homeland Security advising who authorities should prioritize for immigration enforcement. Top priorities for arrest and deportation will include terrorism suspects, criminals, and those who have recently crossed the border illegally. Recent crossings are being defined as those who crossed after November 1st of last year. Homeland Security said an individualized approach will be used for each case, taking into account the totality of facts surrounding that case. The new rules are set to go into effect at the end of November. A 22 year old driver killed after he was hit head on in San Antonio. Police say the crash happened when two cars were street racing. The victim was killed on Prue Road as the two drivers raced side by side until coming up to a hill where the 22 year old was in his car and was hit overnight. An 18 year old driver expected to be charged with street racing, serious bodily injury and manslaughter. The second driver involved in the street racing is still in the hospital. It's a local school district that's been through more than half a dozen superintendents in 10 years. One year into his new position, South San Antonio ISD Superintendent Mark Pugh and the Board of Trustees there find themselves at odds. The board again attracting the wrong attention from the Texas Education Agency. Now the TEA is appointing a monitor to try to keep operations moving smoothly. Dr. Abe Saavedra, who was a former superintendent for South San ISD, will now keep an eye on those operations between the board and the current superintendent. Saavedra held that position from 2014 to 2018. Live cam outside tonight, 76 degrees, and you can see it is all calm downtown right now, but there is a line heading our way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a line of thunderstorms collecting and sort of coming together off to our west. We're talking Valverde County, Edwards County, moving into parts of the hill country. And overall, I do anticipate a damp morning commute with some delays and obviously wet roadways. And there's going to be some heavy rain, heavy rain at times. So anticipate some delays in the morning. Uh, also, we could pick up a quick one to four inches depending on location uh, tomorrow morning just from the rainfall. So there is the slight chance of some flash flooding in some parts of town. However, this bottom headline is the key. 
I do have some optimism for the Friday night football games. Rain chances aren't going to be the same throughout the day tomorrow. So let's get right to it and talk about this. First of all, what's happening out there right now off to the west. That's the heavy rain, a lot of lightning and thunder. It's a light show moving into the hill country right now. And in western Edwards County, where you see that yellow box, that indicates a severe thunderstorm warning until 1045 p.m. And I think the most the strongest part of the storm or most dangerous would be right here in that little Boeing segment. You could have some wind gusts around 60 miles per hour in southern Edwards County. Luckily, it's a very fairly rural part of the county. Nonetheless, still some folks out there. So southern Edwards County, you could have those gusts up to 60 miles per hour. Locally, nothing, just a little bit of ground clutter on the radar. That's that green that you see. Here's the big picture. A lot of activity coming together throughout this afternoon and evening, and it just continues to do so off to our west and even the north. So a good chunk of Texas actually getting some good beneficial soaking rain out of this as it moves our way could be too much of a good thing at times tomorrow morning because of our recent heavy rainfall. We are actually saturated and it's not going to take a whole lot to cause some pockets of flash flooding. I like our future cast with the timing and location of the showers and storms as we go through the night. It stays west of us closer to sunrise and even in the pre dawn hours we start to see it around San Antonio and through the morning commute we'll see that activity but by the noon hour it starts to move eastward and break up and I think the afternoon will largely be dry. That's why I have a lot of optimism for football games, but we'll still have a few showers and thunderstorms dotting the radar screen in random places. So I think there could be a few delays with some football games, but it's not going to be the majority of them. So here are rain chances for tonight and into tomorrow. 3 a.m. 40% from about 5 a.m. all the way through 10 a.m. up to 70%. And then we see those chances drop off into the afternoon and evening. So Friday night kickoff football times, about a 30% chance. So a few hit or miss, highly isolated or stray showers and thunderstorms. Temperatures right now, 70s, some low 80s off to the west. It's humid though. Dew points, low 70s, it is muggy out there. That's going to change next week. I want to point that out. It's going to stay humid through the weekend, but come next week, if you don't like this thick humidity, you'll get a break from it and you'll enjoy the weather next week. So the highest rain chances again, morning commute tomorrow, even a few hours before sunrise, then tapering off a bit through the noon hour with just a few hit or miss random pop up showers and storms by the afternoon. 85 the high temperature. Also, I think we'll squeeze in some sunshine tomorrow. Saturday, just some scattered activity developing, but not a whole lot in terms of coverage. Only about 40% of our area. Sunday, starting to clear out, a lot of sunshine. We have that off chance of a shower, but I don't have a lot of confidence in actually seeing anything develop. And then next week, sunny, dry, right near 90, and low humidity. Everything's going to green up nicely, huh? Mm -hmm. That'll be nice. Thanks, Adam. All right, Greg. Do you have your rain jacket just in case? I sure do, because we have to be live at 5 and 6 tomorrow, but we got in the games tonight, and that yes. was a big concern of mine, as well as you all know. When we come back, Brennan puts their number one ranking on the line, as well as their undefeated season tonight. And Manu still has grandpa juice <laughs> coming up. My new Ginobili showing us has a little leftover grandpa juice as a new Spurs special advisor to basketball operations. Still has some ups in big board sports, but first. Brennan Bears looking to stay undefeated of this season as a result improved to 5 0 as their number one team in 12's top 12, playing host to Stevens in this district showdown at Gustafson Stadium. And the Falcons suffer a bear attack early. Ashton DeBose playing action pass going up. Hopped right there to Jaheim Lard for the touchdown. The 30-yard strike makes it 7-0. The final from Gustafson Stadium to kick off our big game coverage on a Thursday night. 58 to nothing. Brennan, a packed fair stadium to check out a key matchup in District 29-6A as Jay faced off against Marshall. Both with just one loss coming into this game. Jane down 10, but they have the ball first. Goal from the Rams' two-yard line. They give it to Xander Huerta, who plows his way into the end zone to make it a three-point game. But here come the Rams. The pitch goes to Anthony Conway. He's going to bounce to the outside. 
down the sideline. No one's going to catch him. 54 yards for the score. Makes it 27-17 Rams in the second. The final from Ferris, 41-14 Marshall. The Edison Golden Bears are one of the surprise teams this year. But then again, so are the Lanier Volks, who started their season undefeated at 4-0. If the Volks are going to stay undefeated tonight, they're going to have to come from behind and do it again. Edison quarterback Roger Lopez looking to pass. He finds Isaiah Tovar wide open down the sideline. That's good enough for a 34-yard gain down to the Lanier 16-yard line. The Bears cap off the drive right here with quarterback keeper Lopez pushes away from the one-yard line. 7-0 Edison, the final from Alamo Stadium. 16-6, Edison gives Lanier their first loss. Now let's head to Davenport High School where the Wolves are hosting Holy Cross Knights. Third quarter, Davenport up 13-0. They're going to add to that lead. Tristan Hamlin hits Tyler Payne on the slant. He's gone for the 31-yard touchdown. The Wolves lead grows to 20 in the final from Davenport. It is 34-6, Davenport. The Somerset Bulldogs are on the road in Freer to meet Adago tonight. The Bulldogs take control early. Cole Detmer rolls out to his right, throws to the end zone to Taj Jones. It's good for a 21-yard touchdown. And Somerset has not done the Bulldogs' first and goal. Ball goes to Wyatt Weichel for the score. 14-0 Somerset, the final from Freer, 28-6. Bulldogs. The Marion Bulldogs, by the way, are off to a 5-0 start. While that is impressive on its own, we have learned that the best start was actually 1982, according to two articles from the Seguin Gazette. Share with Case at 12 Sports. The Bulldogs started 82 season at 6-0 following the win over Dripping Springs, but after one of their star athletes was injured, they would drop off at the rest of the season. Tomorrow, when the Bulldogs meet the Indians in Jordanton, they'll have a chance to match their best start in team history and will be there as part of Big Game Coverage Road Trip. How did the Cowboys split time in the backfield? It was actually by design. Next. Pro football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. The Dallas Cowboys report the star defensive end Randy Gregory did not practice today due to a knee injury, but the, so far there's been no status release for his availability against the Carolina Panthers this Sunday. Now, one way the Cowboys are trying to keep star running back Ezekiel Elliott healthy is sharing time with Tony Pollard. Through the first three games of the season, Zeke and Pollard have combined for 382 yards with Elliott rushing for 199 total yards and Pollard 183. Pretty even by design. We've been uh, doing well, um, you know, it's the way we've been, been doing it. I think, you know, we're keeping everyone fresh. Um, we added an extra game this season, so it's not 16, it's now 17. Added an extra game to an already long season. So, I mean, I think the biggest thing is uh, keep everyone fresh, um, keep everyone as healthy as long as we can. And, and uh, once we hit, get, get in the fall, uh, you know, just being fresh, ready to go while other teams are wearing down. All right, congratulations to Cowboy cornerback Trayvon Diggs. He's been named the NFC Defensive Player of the Month for scoring three interceptions in the first three games of the season, the first in Cowboys history since Everson Wolves pulled that off back in 1985. When the Spurs tip off their 2021-22 regular season, they will have lost one Australian, but they have gained another. Gone is Patty Mills, the last member of the 2014 championship team. That's after the popular Aussie signed with the Brooklyn Nets. But during this offseason, the Spurs signed another Australian in 6'11 center Jock Landale, the 25-year-old from Melbourne, who played with Patty on the Australian national team during the Summer Olympics and now replaces him on the Spurs. And guess when he found out he was headed to San Antonio? To be honest with you, when my agent called and said, hey, you know, you're not going to be going back to Europe or Australia, you're going to be going to the NBA next year because you got an offer from the Spurs. I was like, there's no way, man. Like, don't, don't, don't mess with me like this. Like, we're about to play the U.S. Just don't, don't mess with me. And, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of how it went. Now, get that. He gets the news. He's probably headed to San Antonio before they're getting ready to get on the court and play against Greg Popovich, the head coach of the Spurs and the U.S. Olympic team. Pop is great at mind games. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. No pressure. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks Greg. Greg. We'll be right back. I, it, have you seen this video? Even if you have, look at this again. This is a man in Mount Dora, Florida. He knew how to corral a hissing alligator on his property. Eugene Bossy just used a garbage can to capture the alligator while neighbors cheered him on. It's a surprise for the trash guy. Aye, aye, aye. Okay, not really. He rolled the can to a nearby water. You see, it looks like, yeah, to a nearby creek. Take off. And release the reptile. Oh, no one was hurt. Just leave the leave it. Yeah. Just get the trash can later. Both man and animal are safe. Gutsy. That is a trick right there. Gutsy. That's pretty slick, if you ask me. Yeah, I knew you'd like that. Yeah. So tomorrow morning, best chance of rain, then tapering off by the afternoon. All right. Kasky's gonna be looking for alligators. <laughs> yeah, probably a new technique.